Educate Philippines recognizes that Filipinos highly value education. As a matter of fact, education is a non-negotiable aspect of our culture. Parents always prioritize their children's education above other things. Teachers dedicate their lives to imparting knowledge to the students the best way they can. Students demand relevant knowledge for their academic and professional success to enable them to contribute to national and global development. It is for these reasons that Educate Philippines offers its services to academic institutions in the Philippines to provide the right technology to teach and learn online. Educate Philippines exists to tackle the lack of LMS in institutions of basic and higher learning and the problem in connecting the teachers and students to the Internet. To succeed today, organizations need to adapt and evolve with new skills and capabilities, from machine learning to design thinking, blockchain to business skills. And the need is massive. 74% of organizations know that reskilling their workforce is important in the next 12 to 18 months, but only 10% feel ready to address this trend. At Skillsoft, our goal is to democratize learning. So we set out to create a new kind of platform based on a fundamental belief that every person has the potential to be amazing. The result, a digital learning platform driven by flexibility and personalization. It's powered by AI, but has people at its heart. Skillsoft Percipio helps learners accomplish goals, celebrate their journey and unleash their edge. How does Percipio do it? It's all about the journey. Aspire journeys are pre-curated, role-based, and skill-based learning paths that help companies prepare employees for the high-demand roles needed today and tomorrow, like agile development, data science, cloud computing, and leadership development. AI makes it easy. Breadth of content is great, but you need curation and customization to make it useful. 
Our AI-driven homepage keeps things fresh, engaging, and relevant for each and every learner. Search in HumanSpeak. Percipio's search functionality uses Google Bird natural language processing AI, which means learners spend more time learning and less time searching. Bad job. Learners celebrate, record, and socialize their achievements with verifiable digital badges that are theirs to keep. Over 5 million earned and counting. Seamless experience everywhere. Percipio lets users learn in whatever increment they have time for. Bouncing between media formats, devices, and collaboration tools like MS Teams seamlessly, without losing track or progress along the way. They can even learn while in the flow of work with our embedded learning synchronized assistant, ELSA for short. Customization and integration. Administrators can customize learning tracks, host content from other providers, and integrate into any LMS. We make it easy to make it your own. Our users already love the results they're getting from Precipio. And that's just the beginning. As the market evolves, so will Precipio, with more capabilities, more integration, and more ease of use with every iteration. Each step brings us that much closer to our mission, to democratize learning and help organizations, teams, and individuals unleash their edge. I'm here to talk about Educate. If you don't know what Educate is, well, it's a solution to the current educational problem here in the Philippines. It all started when the world got screwed over by the virus. No one was allowed to meet face to face. That includes classes. So Aldrin, the CEO of Educate, decided to develop a system that would help the Philippines with their educational problems. 
With his expertise, working in Australia, he brought about Educate, a one-stop place for online learning to be a solution to the current problems of learners and educators. This includes a learning management system, hosting, maintenance, training, support, and many more to provide the right tools and expertise to make distance learning simple and easy. We believe that no Filipino students should be left behind. So what are you waiting for? We welcome you to the Educate Fab.
pace of information sharing feels stomping these days, but digital signage can keep your entire campus informed in just minutes. With digital signage, you can remotely manage a network of signs, share events, and announcements. Keep your campus safe by publishing your health protocols and emergency notifications, and help students navigate. If you choose to, various departments can have access to their own digital signage, specific to their audience and communication needs. Or, with a cloud-based system, you have the option of controlling your messaging from one location. Whether you are striving to support distance learning or eventually attendance at sporting events or to draw attention to your esteemed guest speakers, digital signage can make it much easier. Several applications of digital signage in schools such as digital bulletin boards, educational content, digital directories, digital menu boards, financial literacy, and seasonal events. For more information, visit www.intelsolend.com, an exclusive partner of EarthServe Consulting and Solutions in the Philippines. To succeed today, organizations need to adapt and evolve with new skills and capabilities from machine learning to design thinking, blockchain to business skills. And the need is massive. 74% of organizations know that reskilling their workforce is important in the next 12 to 18 months, but only 10% feel ready to address this trend. At Skillsoft, our goal is to democratize learning. So we set out to create a new kind of platform based on a fundamental belief that every person has the potential to be amazing. The result? A digital learning platform driven by flexibility and personalization. It's powered by AI, but has people at its heart. Skillsoft Percipio helps learners accomplish goals, celebrate their journey, and unleash their edge. How does Percipio do it? It's all about the journey. Aspire journeys are pre-curated, role-based, and skill-based learning paths that help companies prepare employees for the high-demand roles needed today and tomorrow, like agile development, data science, cloud computing, and leadership development. AI makes it easy. Breadth of content is great, but you need curation and customization to make it useful. Our AI-driven homepage keeps things fresh, engaging, and relevant for each and every learner. Search in human speak. Percipio's search functionality uses Google BERT natural language processing AI, which means learners spend more time learning and less time searching. Badge up. Learners celebrate, record, and socialize their achievements with verifiable digital badges that are theirs to keep. Over 5 million earned and counting. Seamless experience everywhere. Percipio lets users learn in whatever increment they have time for. Bouncing between media formats, devices, and collaboration tools like MS Teams seamlessly, without losing track or progress along the way. They can even learn while in the flow of work with our embedded learning synchronized assistant, ELSA for short. Customization and integration. Administrators can customize learning tracks, post content from other providers, and integrate into any LMS. We make it easy to make it your own. Our users already love the results they're getting from Precipio. And that's just the beginning. As the market evolves, so will Precipio, with more capabilities, more integration, and more ease of use with every iteration. Each step brings us that much closer to our mission, to democratize learning, and help organizations, teams, and individuals unleash their edge. Hi, I'm Alex, and I'm here to talk about Educate. If you don't know what Educate is, well, it's a solution to the current educational problem here in the Philippines. It all started when the world got screwed over by the virus. No one was allowed to meet face to face. That includes classes. 
So Algren, the CEO of Educate, decided to develop a system that would help the Philippines with their educational problems. With his expertise working in Australia, he brought about Educate, a one-stop place for online learning to be a solution to the current problems of learners and educators. This includes a learning management system, hosting, maintenance, training, support, and many more to provide the right tools and expertise to make distance learning simple and easy. We believe that no Filipino students should be left behind. So what are you waiting for? We welcome you to the Educate family.
everyone welcome to the UP College of Education ERLC webinar series 2 our session 13 is entitled engaging learners during remote learning I am Frances Olivia Miharis Magpoto you can call me teacher Leah I am part of the special education or SPED area here in the college with me today is Jenny Palabasan, who with her master's in psychology has experience in teaching and assessing students in Singapore. She is currently a Department of Education teacher at the senior high school level. We also have teacher Royce Salva, who is a full-time faculty member of the De La Salle University Desmarinas. 
he is a SPED major through and through starting from his bachelor's of elementary education to his master's in education. He also teaches courses in special education. Both teacher Jenny and teacher Royce are PhD SPED students in our college. I would like to start with a chosen definition of inclusive education. And this is a process, it, is, it says that inclusive education is a process of strengthening the capacity of the, of the educational system to reach out to all learners. I chose this definition because it emphasizes that one, inclusive education is a process. So anytime we stop including learners, it would mean that inclusive education ceases to exist. It is very timely for us to focus on this simply because of the current context that we have, which is known technically as education in emergencies. We would also want to focus on ways to strengthen the capacity of our educational system to reach out to all learners. And this is why um, Teacher Royce, Teacher Jenny, and I looked into strategies that were used by teachers and student teachers who went through the process of learning with our students this semester. I'd like to focus also on defining features of inclusive environments because I'd like to believe that the Philippine education system is inclusive. I, we wanted to look into access, participation, and supports that are currently present. When we say access, we mean that each and everyone has access to the general education curriculum and learning environment. When we say participation, it's this looked into um, how all learners can participate in all activities and routines through scaffolding and intervention. And we look into supports that teachers had. So all teachers have the tools they need to help all learners who have unique strengths and needs. Why access? So based on the elements of a rights-based conceptual framework for education, we note three rights. We have the right of access to education, the right to quality education, and the right to, res to respect in the learning environment. And as we see components here in re with regards to the right of access to education, we would see that we would want education to be accessible, that everyone has equal access to it, throughout the lifespan. And this is because we want to develop lifelong learners from all walks of life. We also look into the right to quality education. We have heard a lot of feedback that may not, that may show that we may not be in the ideal situation. We do recognize the right to quality education. And this is why um, we, had to make sure that the K-12 curriculum was broad, relevant, and inclusive in response to the emergency situation that we are in. The Department of Education has made the most essential learning competencies or MELTs in order to modify the original K-12 curriculum to fit our school year's needs. Um, we also had to ensure that everyone was in a safe and healthy environment. And we chose as main learning delivery mode, remote learning. We also have the right to respect in the learning environment. And thus, hopefully, most of our lessons focus on showing respect for the identity of our learners for their participation rights and for the integrity also in concepts. So in achieving this, we also looked into partnership in the decision-making process wherein coordination and collaboration were seen. 
we have to remember that with our right to access to education comes the responsibility to participate in it. It is only with our participation that we can work towards quality education delivered in wholesome learning environments. So we should do our part. When we talk about participation, we mean participation in the prescribed curriculum of the DepEd. So originally, it was the DepEd K-12 curriculum, which was modified for this school year 2020-2021. You see here two pictures of handbooks that were given that were supposed to guide us. With it were modules that were developed throughout the school year. Here, I think that most of us are still developing our lessons to respond to, her, to them. So you will hear later on, Teacher Royce will be referring to the MELCs or the most essential learning competencies later on in his talk. We talk about curriculum, and to us, it is a technical term in education. So curriculum, we have to understand, comes, comes from the Latin word currere, which means to raise. So if everyone can just imagine us having a curriculum as a race track, because curriculum literally means course of study, we can ask, who are the racers? So the racers that I depicted here in this slide, you would see are five, <laughs> five colored. One is sitting down on the bench, the blue one, supposed to represent the learner who is at the beginning level in terms of proficiency. We have here the brown one, slowly gaping, facing, who is developing his skills. We have one who is approaching proficiency in the competencies that, that the lessons teach. We also have one who is proficient, so can navigate through the curriculum with such. And we have the yellow one over there who's actually at the finish line because they are advanced. What does this mean, basically? So I took the Department Order 31 series of 2012 to look into the descriptive grade system that we have currently. Um, with it also comes with a numerical equivalent, probably to guide us who may be more familiar with the numerical grading system. So what I'd want to emphasize then is the level of engagement that each learner can have based on their grade levels. Start with the uh, advanced learner. So advanced, I'd like to think, would be more applied to the level of proficiency. So a student may have advanced levels of proficiency in certain competencies, and they may probably have a mixture of proficient, approaching proficiency, developing, and beginning skills. But once we know their level, so if you note that they are advanced in that competency, then the level of engagement that we would have would be for us to work the higher level, grade level standard. If they're grade four, maybe look into possible lessons that are grade five level. So see what the threshold of the child is so that they're fully engaged in the educational process. When you see that they are proficient, we at the home and in the school and in our community must provide options for real life application. And this is for our students to learn that Learning does not just happen in school. It doesn't come from modules, workbooks. What they are learning in school are relevant throughout life. We have approaching proficiency. When a student is at that level, the level of engagement would be in opportunities for practice given. This is for them to look into activities, worksheets, um, puzzles, maybe even games anything that may reinforce their understanding of uh, and knowledge of that skill. In, when they are developing, the lessons are may be augmented with after-school sessions and work. And this is practically because 
sometimes the lessons that are taught are new to them. It was always at the introductory portion that they had. And so they might just not know it yet. So first learn. So they need more time to um, imbibe what's being taught. The begin a uh, learner at the beginning level of proficiency may be um, at low may have achievement at the, uh, the which is lower in terms of their grade level, and for this we may need remediation and intervention in order for us to engage them. So this is practically what most of us envision in an ideal setting that we engage learners starting from their level of proficiency in each competency. And this is how we ensure their engagement. So after looking into the race first, we would like to see what the race course looks like. So if this one is our prescribed curriculum, see there, originally round, maybe made of asphalt, something. The DepEd has made it, it, made it their responsibility to modify it for us. So in modifying, there are three things that can be changed. The curriculum content, the performance expectations, and the goals of objectives of the whole curriculum. And you'd see that maybe in terms of curriculum content, instead of using laboratory work that wherein they'd be mixing chemicals, some science teachers may have looked into using um, items that are at home in order for students to learn. So it's the same skill and knowledge applied within the house setting. In terms of performance expectations, you'd note that the course there is broken into several segments. And this is because we do want to know which particular lessons are indeed relevant at this time. In goals of ob and objectives, you'd see a thinning of the course there and they have two colors. So um, thinned out the original, curriculum road and it is coupled with another program that is there and we find that most of it is in relation to how they will access the lessons online so navigation on the platforms that they're using um, self-regulation skills because they don't have their teachers and classmates to be there with them fixing up their home environment so that it's conducive to work and study. So there are a lot of things to be looked into because the race course can look like so many things. So instead of just an oval, it could be like a car race course wherein it's curving all over. It could be a swimming, swimming pool wherein it's a lap that we're looking at. It could also happen wherein it looks like it... Um, can be um, what's cross-country. There are two more concepts that will be covered in terms of navigating the race course. So accommodations will be covered by Teacher Royce and the universal design of learning will be covered by Teacher Jenny. So I'd like to bring up a question. Who does the work? Um, we know that if the racers do the work for themselves, they are rewarded with achievement motivation. And this is defined as the desire to perform well and reach high levels. Research has shown us that the way for us to develop achievement motivation are four things. One is the encouragement for independence. So when assigned certain modules and worksheets, Although sometimes it may take longer than we'd want to, we allow our children to do their work. We have high expectations for them because although we recognize that the context is um, the pandemic, plus there were typhoon-related um, incidents and such, our context just says that we should allow them just to rest so that we can take care of their mental health. They should then also know that we have certain expectations of them because we do 
recognize them as the future of our country. We'd like also them to develop, them to have demonstrated warmth, so the environment having such, and for them to have access to plenty of support and help. So I do recognize that there are times when these two, demonstrating warmth and, and having plenty of support and help, may be hard at times. So just note that we are all challenged. I like to make all parents aware of this achievement motivation simply because there is a flip side to it and it is called learned helplessness wherein there is no clear relationship between actions and their consequences. So sometimes you hear stories about parents having to force their children to run on that race course. Sometimes the parents have to carry them um, and sometimes the parents would be just so tired and they'd want to do the work. And so you'd see the child there not doing anything, just cheering their parents on. So who does the work? I guess that's something that we should all reflect on, myself included. In terms of supports, I would like to show you some strategies that teachers who we've uh, we've talked to contributed to us. So these are sharings of how they conducted their synchronous sessions, noting here that the context is that their classes, their schools were able to conduct the synchronous sessions online. I'd like to thank before <laughs> anything else, the teachers who shared the strategy. So we have Teachers Mo, Maru, Sharon, and Gladys, and our Educ 180 SPED majors under Dr. Lutze Sol Vidal, the teacher Aini, teacher Erica, teacher Jim, teacher Yuna, and teacher March. Thank you for being generous enough to write down those strategies so that we can cover them today. In Teacher Mo's Zoom class, so she had eight grade six students and she taught math and science. She actually shared that she was capable of doing interactive presentations. And apparently, because I didn't know this, Zoom has a remote control function. So this allowed her students to click hyperlinks, maximize the PowerPoint animations. She used movable elements. She allowed her learners to input their answers in tables and text boxes in order for her to engage them. Um, to prepare the, them for these kinds of activities, she did have to teach them technology basics, and she had online classrooms that they had to follow. She used personalized videos for them, socialization blocks in order to enhanced her social and communication domain. She also utilized offline tasks and private comments to further engage her students. And of course, coordination and collaborations with parents and guardians were important to her classroom. One of the things that I noted about her class is that she had the capacity to meet her students two to three at a time. So although they are eight, she was capable of doing that. So lots of flexibility in a supportive environment, which allowed her students to have classes in the morning and in the afternoon, get the additional programs that they have, such as therapy and such. We have teacher Maru strategies. So she is a kindergarten teacher of learners with special education needs. There were 14 with ages ranging from um, 8 to 13. So she used videos to facilitate routine. She also used this for lesson content. And they were available through a shared drive that she had with the parents and students. She also used uh, in her modules, she had online and offline activities. So these were composed of worksheets, supervised playtime, arts and crafts, story time, and food preparation. She had a very, very strong um, partnership with the parents. And her, in her sharing, she really show, showed us that 
um, she'd communicate with them daily through through a script that she provided. So it's a daily parent guide that they had. They had upskilling sessions every Saturday so that if parents had any questions, she'd be able to um, respond to them quickly. In, in the module, she also had a parent comment box, which was helpful in knowing where the problematic areas in the modules were. Teacher Sharon, um, her shared activity seemed like something that her school practiced. So it was collaboration amongst teachers, students, and parents, and this through parent-teacher partnership with um, parent-teacher conferences that were more than just quarterly. They also had a weekly schedule for school shuttles to bring and to deliver and to receive the printed um, activity sheets and when they're done. They also had constant feedback, so you'd see the responsiveness of the system. She had a strong relationship with students by keeping small classes. They followed the depth and suggested screening time, depending on the grade level. And their synchronous sessions were recorded and posted. Of course, constant feedback was also given to the students. And they developed tasks that entailed socialization because they encouraged collaboration amongst the students. Collaboration amongst the teachers were for the performance tasks. So instead of having one um, project for one subject, they'd be integrating with another subject so that it could be more focused on the competency levels. They also extended their deadlines, so activity sheets were accepted even after the due dates. So that kind of kindness and compassion shown by a school system is deeply appreciated by the parents and students. Okay. We have here teacher Gladys' strategies, and she teaches in college. So what she shared was that she used, uh, she made use of varied online platforms available to her. These were Gmail, Facebook Messenger, Google Hangouts, Big Sky, which was their school's official online platform. They also, for her modules, she would have announcements for newly uploaded modules. They, she provided um, specific instructions. She pre-recorded video lectures, which were augmented by a word text that were provided. They, she'd modify module tasks for students who experience anxiety, stress, and emotional conditions. So she would um, look into that and extend due dates and follow up them, okay? And then she'd have reminders. There, and through Big Sky, their official online platform, they actually set were setting rewards and accomplishment records. So there was a, um, a system of recognition within their college. We have two slides that were shared by the EDUC 180 SPED majors this semester. Um, they were in one-on-one -on -one setups. For, for So there were five of them, as you've seen in my thank you slide. So... They used behavior management in order to increase the engagement of their learners. They recognized that they had a reward system for specific agreed-upon behavior. So they had online stickers and tokens, favorite foods and toys, and verbal praises. They had Zoom virtual classroom rules that they agreed upon. They had assistance from facilitators. They used visual reminders, such as the homework board and to-do lists, so the students were on track. They used animations and movement of text, and sometimes they do shorter text and phrases when giving instructions. Verbal cueing happened before their class sessions, and sometimes even during. They made use of other messaging applications, um, as they reported. 
And they also had individualized motivational strategies. Um, the specific examples that they shared were faith-based or something that was relatable, a personal um, motivation that the, they knew the child had. They actually looked into the physical activities that would happen during their lessons too. Um, they were mindful that in preparing and conducting their classes, that the materials that they used be relatable, interactive, and visually stimulating. They also made sure that they had an established routine for things to flow well throughout the school year. Um, they noted that they needed to be firm but kind. No, the balance probably between knowing when to put your foot down and when to be flexible was their challenge as student teachers. They um, had to think out of the box in certain situations because this, this period that we have is unprecedented. We have never had a full-blown remote learning set up for our Philippine educational system. So taking note that this batch of teachers and student teachers are pioneering. They had to recognize that Zoom fatigue is real. And so they were mindful of the screen time that they had. They mentioned that they had a support system in place. Um, they collaborated with the subject teachers in the school that they were assigned. They would count on their student teachers, their co-student teachers, and they had teacher leads as their practicum advisor. They had this term that they called it alagang teacher leads. So they needed the support. So I guess if student teachers need it, maybe the teachers need it. Maybe the parents need it too. Maybe the students need it. So just mindful that everyone is dealing with something no matter what. So, yeah, we should practice kindness in all that we do. Oh, it says here that they were energetic. They needed to up the energy during their presentations. But they said here, pero wag sabayan ng mga because, of course, it becomes an unruly class of people. Um, if they continue on that way. And the last that they shared was to be patient and pray, pray, pray. So I guess that's how um, our teachers handled this semester. We will be going next to teacher Jenny's presentation. She'd be presenting um, case studies of teachers who instead of doing online lessons, had a mix of synchronous and asynchronous sessions. So, Teacher Jenny? Thank you, Teacher Leah. Good morning. I'm Teacher Jenny. I'm a DepEd teacher, and I'm enrolled in this class in the PhD program that supervises MA students in their teaching practicum, and also in another class that look into family systems that might affect the development and learning of students during this world health crisis. So my task for today is to share with you the concerns of the MA students and the experiences of parents of learners with special educational needs during this pandemic. The unprecedented effect of COVID-19 made it really impossible for the educational system to conduct face-to-face -face teaching that gave rise to distance learning. Given that situation, the Department of Education has come up with multiple learning modalities to deliver basic education services to its learners. And these are the distance learning, blended learning, and homeschooling. Under distance learning, there are three types. The modular distance learning, which can be printed or digital, online distance learning, and the TV radio-based instruction. In connection with what teacher Leah shared, these are the concerns of the MA practicum students in their online classes. Parents and guardians are the ones answering the questions. Format of the online platform caused stress on students. Limited time and unnecessary background noise in the house. So how did they solve this? They informed parents and guardians about the goal of the activity. And that is for the students to be able to do the activity as much as possible with minimal supervision. For the format of the online platform, 
teachers had to remind the students, inform the students of the layout of the format, and assure them that it was just okay. Because some of, stu of the students had problem whenever they see their screen become smaller when the teacher started presenting the lesson online. For the limited time, teachers really had to plan well the activities. So all the students have the chance to uh, participate in the activities that they prepared. To avoid unnecessary background noise, they practiced the, this one mouth rule and they taught the students how to use the mute and unmute button. Uh, so if there would be an un uh, undesirable or unnecessary background noise, the class will not be distracted. During this learning from home, more responsibilities are placed on the parents, especially in terms of students' learning. I'll be presenting to you today our case study and the overarching themes uh, from the narratives of the parents and present some ways on how to help parents address some of their concerns. So we conducted, the, we conducted this case study entitled Distance Learning Experiences of Parents of Children with educa Special Educational Needs, and these are my classmates. One of them is one of the speakers today, that is Sir Roy Salva. So we interviewed eight parents uh, of learners with special educational needs in the public schools, and we identified the reasons for choosing the learning delivery modality, and they also share the specific experiences of during the modular distance learning. And they ad identified the challenges, opportunities, and adapting strategies to distance learning. Six out of eight mothers were working, and most of them uh, did it through online platforms. So here is, here are the overarching themes of our study that emerged from the interviews. The first one is accessibility. This theme includes the factors that the respondents considered when choosing the online delivery modality. Due to limited resources, the respondents opted for modular distance learning. Next is the advantage of modular distance learning. Flexibility, convenience, being able to individualize the lesson and and being more aware of the lessons were found to be the advantages of modular distance learning. Since some of the parents were working, they were able to manage their time when to conduct lessons with their children. Also, the distance learning gave them more time to get to know the skills of their children and give help when needed. Concerns of the mothers, they share the challenges that they experience uh, on this distance learning, which I will focus on later. For the social support, they identified the support they received from family members, uh, teachers, neighbors, and even online community groups. Support from the family members was focused on taking care of the child, providing financial support, or doing household chores. Based on the results of the study, students' learning was found to be the sole responsibility of the mothers. For the outliers, opposing remarks emerge about the work of the teachers. Others view teachers as work in progress because some parents share the insufficiency of materials and instructions given to them. On the other hand, other parents express their appreciation of the teachers' effort during this pandemic. So for the, te for the concerns of mothers, this include pedagogical skills. Parents acting as teachers stated that they do not know how to teach the material or the module being given by the teachers. And other parents ended up photocopying the modules a number of times and giving it to their child just for the child to do something. Another concern is mothers feel overwhelmed balancing the work of being a mother, a wife, a, a, a businesswoman, office staff, a daughter, and now as a teacher should be really overwhelming for them. And the last concern is the effect on children's behavioral and social skills. The following are the narratives of parents in our case study. Naku, maraming pagbabago. Unang-una, akala ko dati nanay lang ako. Ngayon, naging teacher na rin ako. To tell you the truth, minsan syempre, ngayon ko lang na-appreciate talaga how hard it is ang magturo ng isang bata na may special needs. Kasi it takes a lot of patience and encouragement. So this one has something to do with the new role uh, of the mother as teachers and the appreciation of the role of the teachers. 
Modyo lang kasi more on nanay lang talaga nakakaalam kung ano isasagot ng bata. Mas maganda talaga yung teacher talaga kasi alam nila paano turuan ang bata. Kasi kung kami mga magulang, syempre gusto naming matapos agad yung mga sasagutin. Kaya yung ibang mami na gumagawa para mabilis matapos. So even in modular distance learning, other parents would would do the modules for their children. Actually, pag sa modular kasi ngayon, hindi ko masyadong, although my idea ko, pero hindi enough yung natuturo. Kasi hindi naman ako teacher. Eh, wala naman gabay yung mga teacher and nagbibigay lang sila ng module. So, this implies lack of uh, or insufficiency of instructions given by the teachers and lack of pedagogical skills. Last one, parang kulang. Kasi ang isang module siguro dalawang activities lang tapos sasabihin good for one week. Isang module pang pagkat lang, sasabihin lang paano magpakilala, write your name. That's good for one week. So the concerns of the parents found in our case study were found common also to the concerns of mothers in other parts of the country. In other countries, like in the United States, Poland, and China. Uh, one parent from United States mentioned my biggest struggles have been in working with my daughters grades three and five who struggle with learning disabilities dyslexia and add respectively i'm not equipped to try to teach them material and both struggle with organizational and focus organization and focus this this one implies lack of pedagogical skill one for from poland I know that I'm responsible for the future of my children and I am worried because I'm not a good teacher. I have no knowledge, but I feel guilty and I'm aware that I do not always do the right thing. So again, this implies lack of pedagogical skills. One mother from China commented, young children learning online is not good. At home, they are relatively naughty and they do, they do not listen. They only watch TV and mobile phone. So these parents share the behavioral problem of the of the children at home, and I think other parents would equate being naughty to not listening. So maybe the children are not interested anymore in the learning activities and refuse to accomplish them. So how are we going to address the pedagogical concerns of the parents? I will share to you some ideas on how to better help children learning at home in this time of health crisis. So here is the Universal Design for Learning or the UDL. It's a framework to improve and optimize teaching and learning for all people based on scientific insights into how humans learn. So it is not just for, uh, for people with disabilities, so it's for all people. Universal meaning the curriculum should be understood by everyone. Teachers and parents would agree that children differs in terms of their strengths, needs, and interests. So we have to present the lessons when, uh, while considering those things. The next one is learning. Learning is not just one thing. Based on the research, uh, based on research in neuroscience, tells that the brain has three broad neural networks, one for recognition, one for skills and strategies, and one for caring and priorities. But since everyone is different, how can we address them all? We can address them all by the design. How can we design activities that will work for everyone? So looking at this picture, if the man shovels the stairs, only the children will be able to use it. But if the man shovels the ramp, all of them will be able to use it. So the idea of UDL is to think of ways on how to cater the needs of all the learners. It has three principles provide multiple means of representation, provide multiple means of action and expression, and to provide multiple means of engagement. So the first principle is to provide multiple means of representation. This is the what of learning. Every single child learns completely different. So provide multiple means, multiple modes of getting the resources. So you can draw a thing, write it on a paper, on a whiteboard, you can give an audio information, or you can present a video. So this worksheet serves the visual information. So how can we provide audio information? So the instruction here is to look at the following pictures and read the names aloud. So instead of reading all the names over and over again to your child, you can record your voice using your phone and let the child listen to the recording while referring on the worksheet. So parent can just be round the corner and the child can play the 
play the recording over and over again. Or you can type all the words in Microsoft Word and you activate the text to voice or the read aloud so that the child can listen how the words are being pronounced. So this is giving auditory and visual information. Now, looking at this picture, they have the same task to assemble an airplane, but they perceive the task differently. The girl focus on the on the step by step procedure on how to uh, on how to build an airplane but the boy here imagines an airplane and maybe trying to figure out which part goes together to make an airplane the second principle is to provide multiple means of action and expression this is the how of learning by giving different ways the students can express what they know so how can your child demonstrate that he can read all the words in the worksheet you may ask the child this time to record his own, his or her own voice when reading the words, or you can take a video of him or her reading these words. I think kids would love to, generally, they would love to see their, their themselves in the videos and hear their voices over the recording. Another means is that you may let the child read the words by singing them in the tune of, the, of their favorite song. So instead of just reading them, give it i mean you just give it a tune so while reading them or the child might want to draw the pictures of the words that he can he or can or he or she can read or color the pictures that the child can read it's important that to give them the choice on how they're going to express their learning so in this picture, the task is to answer what is photosynthesis. And one girl is writing in her notebook, maybe doing a composition of and explaining what is photosynthesis. Another girl is painting and presenting what, demonstrating what is photosynthesis. And the boy here is taking a video of himself and explaining what is photosynthesis. So different ways of uh, answering the question doing the assignment of what is photosynthesis. The third principle is to provide means of multiple means of engagement. This is the why of learning. Uh, this, is, this principle is about how to stimulate their interest and motivation for learning by knowing why is it matter and why is it important. So you, given this worksheet, instead of just reading it a number of times, you may want to play with the child and do this one what's missing so you present the pictures per rows and then you can cover one picture and ask your child what's missing okay or you may want to use this one the scavenger hand you instead of just giving the same worksheet all the time you can cut the pictures and then you scatter them on the floors and then ask the child to pick the words that the child can read or you may stick them on the wall and then ask the the ask your child to look for the words that he can read or he or she can read okay to incorporate physical activity you can use pick up the hopscotch okay so uh, uh while hopping the child can read the words so incorporating physical activity to literacy so again for udl it's providing children with choices you provide choices on what they are learning on the information that they will get be it auditory, visual, okay, how they are learning, how you're going to stimulate their interest and their motivation, and how they're going to demonstrate what they learn. That's the end of my presentation today. Hope you learned something. I'll turn you over now to Teacher Royce. Thank you so much, Teacher Jen, and this is Teacher Royce, and allow me to add more, to contribute more to what Teacher Leah and Teacher Jen have shared to you today. So if we are talking about engaging learners during remote learning, particularly engaging learners with special needs, it's very impossible that we won't be talking about this thing, the curricular adaptations. And when we talk about curricular adaptations, there are two words that we have to focus on. The first word is curricular, which is something to do with the curriculum. And enable for me to explain easier what curriculum is, I will be using the framework I, P, and O. When we talk about I, it means input, P for process, and O for output. 
And I includes the content areas, the subjects that we are giving to our learners, to our students, English, science, math, TLE, social sciences, and whatnot. And under each content area, there are specific lessons and topics that we have to deliver. And under this specific lessons or topics, we write specific goals or specific objectives which could be found in our respective lesson plans. These are the inputs. Now, if we are talking about the process, it includes the approaches, the methods, the step-by-step -step procedure, the strategies, the techniques that we have to consider in able for us to effectively teach, effectively handle our learners with or without special needs. Now, if we are referring to output, output itself deals with the product that we are requiring our students to do or to make to submit. The performance either ought to, to perform to demonstrate in our classes before, examination or other form of assessments such as quizzes, short tests, and alike. This IPO, this content area, until product or other forms of assessment are all involved or included in the curriculum. The next, next word rather that we have to define is adaptation. And when we are talking about adaptation, we are also dealing with change. May pagbabago. There's a need for adjustment. There's a need for, for changes. And if we talk about curricular adaptations in general, it means there's a change, adjustment, or alteration in any part of the curriculum. May it be the input, may it be the process, or may it be the output. Now, if the changes will happen, either in the input and or output that is actually called modification. Allow me to repeat that. If the teacher would change anything from the content areas, lesson objectives, um, goals, the topics, or the product, performance, and other forms of assessment, that curricular adaptation is actually called modification. But if the teacher is changing something in terms of the process, the approaches, until the techniques, that is called accommodation. Modification and accommodation are two major curricular adaptations that teachers are doing, enable for children with special needs to cope, to adapt better in their respective classrooms. Now, when we are um, trying to apply accommodation, we are trying to change the how of learning, to adjust the how of learning. How will you teach to that student? How will your student learn the how of learning? If we are applying modification, what we are changing is the what of learning. What should be given? What should be delivered? What should be taught? What should be required to your student? What kind of exam will you employ? Will you use? What are the content of that exam? That is modification. Now, why am I telling this? Simply because these two things are very important, enable for our students with special needs to better their condition, better their situation in a classroom, and so as when they're at home. In order for us to fully apprehend or comprehend these two curricular adaptations, allow me to present the different elements of accommodation and modification. Let's go first with accommodation. These are the things that we can change, we can adjust under accommodation aside from the process itself. First one, the duration. When we talk about duration, it involves time. How much time your student with special needs will do the task? So instead of doing that with just five minutes, so considering their condition, considering their situation, you can adjust the time. So duration, learning environment. So sometimes we have to consider if the environment, if the classroom is conducive enough to a specific child with special needs. You have to know the manifestations. Next one, the support. If we are talking about the support, it includes the techniques that we will be using. So for children without disabilities, this strategy is very much applicable. But what if your student has a specific condition? What if your student has intellectual disability? Your student has dyslexia? Your student has ADHD? Your student has autism spectrum disorder? So you have to consider the level, the kind, the degree of support you have to offer. Aside from the support, we also have the assistive devices, the assistive technologies. 
what are the low technology, what are the high technology we can we can offer, we can give, the, enable for that student to to cope, to learn better, to better his or her academic level of performance. So assistive devices would include, aside from the wheelchair, it also includes calculator, it includes um, the abacus, virtual re re reality environment, the VRE, or virtual learning environment, the VLE, that can help them. Scheduling. So there are specific conditions that are actually, specific students also, that are actually performing better in the morning than when they are actually taking exam in the afternoon. So that can also be considered the schedule of activities, schedule of giving exams, schedule of giving um, a certain assessment. We can consider that. When we talk about modification, it involves changes in terms of the quantity of the content. So the quantity of content means we try to lessen the competencies we are requiring from the student. If we think that that student cannot do the task, or if we think that that competency is not that essential for that child, so we can lessen it. We can also add more if we think that our student is capable of doing more than what regular students can do. So quantity of content would mean adding more or decreasing the content itself. So objectives or goals. If there are changes, adjustments in, in the objective or goals set in the class, that is modification. And of course, target assessment. If we try to alter, if we try to adjust our assessment for our class or for that student with special needs, for product, performance, or examination, that is also under modification. The reason why I am trying to explain the different elements of accommodation and modification simply because of one reason. If teachers can do curricular adaptations in the classroom, parents can also do curricular adaptations at home. How can they do that? They simply contextualizing these curricular adaptations from what they are, from what teachers are actually doing in school and bringing it at home. Trying to consider the elements of accommodation and the elements of modification and trying to apply it, employ it to their children with special needs at home. And we can apply modification. Honestly, if we were, if we will be trying to apply modification, it's already explained and given earlier by teacher Lia because since the Department of Education already released the MELC or the MELC or the most essential learning competencies, the Department of Education, the agency itself, already decreased the number of competencies required to the learners. So that alone is a perfect example already of modification. So instead of parents trying to focus too much on the modification side, Parents will just focus on the other side, which is accommodation, since the Department of Education already helped parents in applying modification to, to children with or without special needs. The agency was able to, to decrease already the quantity of the content. The objectives or goals may change in terms of the quantity also. And of course, the product, the performance, the assessment that we're giving at present, we consider the, the situation of the country. During this challenging time, it's hard to, to always require paper and pencil assessment. So different schools have their own strategies on how the competencies could be measured. So dun po sa modification aspect, meron na tayong MELC. Meron na tayong MELC. We can already consider that as a modification part, okay? A modification sign. Now, parents will just focus on the other side, which is accommodation. How can parents use duration, use their learning environment, use um, and could employee support, could use different technology at home, and even consider the schedule of their kids in actually allowing children with special needs to perform better? And for specific examples of accommodations, indulge me for sharing the following accommodations, the following extensions at home. So let's go with the first one, writing. If a parent like you wants to improve the writing skill of your kid, here are the following materials that you can use at home. First one, the clothes pin. You know, before learning the actual writing itself, finger dexterity matters. Um, hand control matters. 
how your child uses his or her hand in writing, it's very important. And before jumping to actual writing skills, hands should learn how to be more flexible. The dexterity should be honed, should be developed fully. And one of the techniques, one of the techniques that we can use to develop the hands more, the finger dexterity more, is using clothespin. Um, if this is a clothespin and there's another clothespin, allowing your kid to just play with a clothespin, like from one tail to another, just like this, connecting all this clothespin, all right, their hands, their finger dexterity could be improved. This is a very effective strategy that therapists are doing, SPED teachers are doing, and the material is just simple, a clothespin. So you can also teach them how to hang their clothes using the clothespin. So this is an activity, a game, and at the same time, a good strategy for you to enhance their, their finger dexterity prior to the actual writing skills. Right after that, of course, the very um, known material, if we want to improve the finger dexterity and hand control, hand movement, the clay or the play-doh. Um, by just allowing your student to, your child rather, to develop a certain art like or mold, mold a figure, a shape. So aside from developing hand uh, dexterity or finger dexterity, even their creativity could be developed, could be enhanced. Um, aside from that, aside from using clothespin and also the Play-Doh or the clay, one of the materials that I am using, I am requiring from parents to do when I'm handling clients, it's instead of just giving the traditional or the usual, the conventional paper with blue, red, blue lines, we give um, paper with bigger spaces, line spaces. And aside from that, we use jumbo pencil because there are students whose hands with finger dexterity are not yet that fully honed. So if we will be giving the use of pencil, the, the very thin pencil, they will be having difficulty holding that or using the tripod grip, the tripod grasp. So before um, allowing them to use that thin pencil, jumbo pencil first could be given. So they could have, you know, that, that hold, practice for them to do tripod grip or tripod grasp. So aside from writing, we have here reading. So if we want to enhance reading, these are the things that we can do. For letter recognition, Usually what I'm, I'm offering, I'm teaching parents to use, it's the powder, the baby powder, okay? Um, particularly if the child doesn't have any allergy with regard to powder. So you just have to put the powder on the table and then scatter it and teach letters to your kid, to your child. Oh, what letter is this? We're trying to draw using the, the, the powder. This is a very good material for your child to recognize letters. So our target here is letter recognition letter recognition if you want to form words that could be done too so that could be word recognition now so next one um this one okay um there are students with special needs such as students with intellectual disability who are actually challenged in terms of word recognition or in terms of many objects at home so we put labels if parents can put labels to to their furniture to their um to different spaces at home to different places at home such as this is a table this is a restroom so we put a label in everything in every object that you have at home your child will not just be exposed with letters will not just be exposed with words they will also be exposed with the names of this object okay so word recognition is very important also it's significant it's relevant for easy reading okay for more flexible reading skills so labeling can also be used so next one this one your photo albums um you want to read definitely you you will not be teaching exactly reading words text using your photo album because you only have photos there but by allowing your kid your child to you know, to look at the photo, try to explain what they can see in the photo, that can trigger comprehension, actually. Um, not just text comprehension or reading comprehension, but actually visual comprehension, which is also important if we are trying to develop reading competencies among our students, among our children, using the photo album. Or what can you see in the photo? Who can you see in the photo? What do you think are the people doing in the photo? So that can help them. 
aside from reading and writing, we have here numeracy. So what can we use for numeracy? Here, the telephone or our cell phones. Um, but we just have to limit the screen time, okay? If we are using the cell phone, the mobile phone. So how can we use these two materials? Number recognition. So if we have the keypad, we can use the keypad to introduce them. What number is this? This is number one. This is zero. This is nine. This is eight. So that number recognition can be improved, can be enhanced using just a telephone and a mobile phone where I believe each household has that. If we don't have that, we can just, you know, try to develop a pseudo phone that can show to our kids and try to recognize what are the numbers they can see on that phone. Okay? So right after that, so we can use um, paper bills and coins. We can use pseudo uh, paper or fake, uh, fake money or fake coins. We can also show that to our students, to our kids, allowing them to recognize what number is this, allowing them to do add and subtract, um, acting like you're, you're a seller, he or she is the buyer, putting some grocery, buying some grocery, for example, a situational um, activity where your student can be engaged more, your child could be engaged more. We can also practice that. So next one, jars and containers. Jars and containers are... Also essential if we want to, to enhance or to, to improve the, the comparing and contrasting skills of our children. By just asking them which of these two jars are bigger, which is smaller, which of this is has or has this kind of shape, which of this has this kind of color. So it can trigger not just shapes, not just color, but even the concept of measurement, the concept of size. We can explore different concepts using just a container and a jar. So that can also be used at home. So for the reference book, I have it here. For the photos or images used, I also have it here. This is Teacher Royce, and I am with Teacher Leah, and I am with Teacher Jen, and we are hoping we are hoping that as parents, as teachers, we have learned so much from today's webinar. God bless everyone. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, po. Morning. So we are hoping that everyone is listening. Everyone was able to to get the right amount of knowledge, the right amount of the of content that we intend to get for this morning. So we are now entertaining questions. So mm -hmm. do we have any question for this uh for this morning? I think there's so one question, sir. Yes, Teacher Jen, we got one question. What, mm -hmm. what is that question, Teacher Jen? That's from uh, Tonette Paren. The question is, how to be an effective online teacher? Mm, how to be an effective online teacher? Well, um, I think, Teacher Jen, we would be able to share so mm -hmm. much about this question. Should I go first? Oh, yeah, sure, I'll, sure. I'll go, first. I'll go first. So for that question, how to become an, an effective online teacher, I think there's no different with regard to the question, how to become an effective classroom teacher. Wala naman po talagang pinagkaiba. Um, similar to, to the pre-pandemic situation in our respective classrooms, we will be needing knowledge, how we deliver the content, we will be needing the skills, we will be needing the right attitude, okay? We have to, to possess that mastery of content. We have to possess that compassion, that empathic understanding towards our student. The only difference is, given the situation at present where remote learning is best used in, in different schools, I think the best thing that we have to consider in able for us to become an effective teacher is to get to know what technological infrastructure 
could be best suitable for you as a teacher and for your students. Before, we don't need much of the technical skills. We don't need much of the technological skills. This time, we will be needing that. Um, hindi po sasapat na um, magaling lang tayong magturo. Okay? Hindi po sasapat na yun lang yung kaya nating i-deliver. So, we will be needing knowledge, content, and still attitude. Plus, the technological skills. How about you, Teacher Jen? Well, I, uh, I just want to share yung experience ng mentee ko. She's doing online class. And then, nung nakita ko yung, on yung online class niya, I saw the engagement of the students. I think first, she set the, the rules. So, kita talaga yung bata doon na nag-engage siya. And aware sila doon sa rules nung, nung online class. And then, uh, I think I think you need you really need to get to know your students that... I mean, that you will get their attention. So that's important when doing online class. Kasi parang yung mga examples, you can relate it to them if you know them. And na, na amaze ako dun sa ano nila kasi parang sabi ko, ang pagkakaiba lang, walang, pers walang touch, parang ano. But they are aware of their classmates. They know who's not in yet in their online class. And parang hinahanap nila. So in terms of social skills, parang andun pa rin. Kasi where is, so hinagahanap ng kaklase dun sa, ano, dun sa online class nila. Got that, Teach. Got that. Thank you, Teach. Thank you, Teacher Jen. We also have another round of question, another question mm -hmm. from Teacher Nina. Okay, so what if the student that we are handling has dyslexia or aphasia? How can he teach numerical concepts? So this mm -hmm. time we will be talking about specific strategies in delivering numerical concepts. Mm -hmm. So allow me to answer that question first. So if we are talking, for the knowledge of everyone, if we are talking about dyslexia, it's a learning disability that has difficulty in terms of letter recognition, word recognition, or reading comprehension, okay? And when we talk about aphasia, it's a learning condition. It's a condition that affects the ability to communicate. To cut it short, if we will try to check the condition of this, uh, of this student who has, who happened to have either dyslexia or aphasia, there's really no problem in terms of understanding numbers. Hindi naman po siya yung tinatawag nating dyscalculia. Who has problems in terms of reading numbers, understanding numbers. So yung pagtuturo po ng numerical concepts, it would be a lot easier to them. Since ang difficulty lang naman has something to do with the ability to communicate and reading. So the best strategy is still nothing beats one-to-one -one association. If we're teaching number concepts, if we're teaching numbers, number one, show a photo. So a certain, a real object, one-to-one -one association, number one is equal to one apple. Number two is equal to, to, two, to two pens. So it would be um, easier for them to understand the concept if we will be using one-to-one -one association. It goes across different conditions. It goes across different levels. May it be kindergarten, may it be grade school, one-to-one -one association would be very effective. So that is... I think I'll agree with that one, sir. <laughs> yung, yeah. yung resources na nasa bahay, I think they can use those things. Yes, Sorry, my mic. There was something that went wrong. Um, in our comments, actually, teacher Ichi Zamora, who also, who also taught in um, Bridges before SPED class, she actually mentioned text, picture exchange, communication, mm -hmm. and, yeah. and the teach method that could be used because generally with those cases, it's really seeing how they um, express the answers, how they see, by how you get to see their knowledge and such. So it would be very good for us to know more details probably about the age of the student so that we can be more specific also about the recommendations that we have asked as asked by teacher Nina. Mm -hmm. Got that, teach, got that. But, um, it's really flattering to see different comments from our audience today. So no. this, uh, these people are coming, these teachers rather are coming from different sides of, of the country. So thank you so much to those who are watching us at present. Thank you so much to these very flattering comments. Um, on behalf of Teacher Jenny and Teacher Dia in the SPED area, we're very much happy and honored to deliver this webinar to you today. Maraming maraming salamat po sa inyong suporta. Thank you so much, everyone. All right. So I think we don't have to. I think we're good. We're, we ha we don't have anything to add anymore. Um, teacher, well, just, anything um, you want to say? I, or I saw one. I saw one. Teacher Roy is from 
Miss Tonette Parem, last question mm -hmm. po. Do you have any apps to recommend to add interest to our learners? Thank you po, sir. I think oh. it's directed to you. Yeah. Mobile application, mm -hmm. got that, got that. If you have any apps that you can recommend. Honestly, teach um when I'm handling students with special needs, in as much as you want to offer high technology software or more by mobile applications, I would rather use the default applications that I could find already in the phone, such as calculator. When I whenever I'm discussing about numbers, arithmetic, addition and subtraction, mm -hmm. what more? Um, the calendar. Whenever I'm teaching dates, whenever I'm teaching days, months of the year. So sometimes we don't have to think too much of the high technology mobile applications. We just have to make use of what's available. Because sometimes these things, these default applications can already do so much to our learners with special needs. Yes. I agree, especially with the screen time that we're trying to yeah, regulate at this point in time with the online learning that we have. Okay. I agree, yeah. Okay. Our, I'm trying to see if there are additional questions. Uh, congratulatory messages mm -hmm. are there. <laughs> Definitely. Yay, congratulations. So, yeah. Mr. Royce, do you want to wrap it up? <laughs> um, teach, uh, just like what I've said, on behalf of the, the UP College of Education and the special education area, we just have to... Um, to wish everyone happy holidays, happy vacation. I hope we would be able to get the right amount of rest enabled for us to continue the next year, next come January. So that would be it. On behalf of, of Teacher Leah and Teacher and we are very much honored to present this topic to you today. God bless everyone. God bless you. Yes.